Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Mary Grant, the Public Water for All Campaign Director at Food and Water Watch. Thank you all for coming. I'm excited to be moderating this event called What's Public About Public Services with David McDonald to discuss how we can build a movement for just public services to counter corporate control. I wanna thank all our partners for co-hosting this event with us, the Utility Justice Coalition, the Center for Biological Diversity, Free Press, the Municipal Services Project, Low for Love of Water, and the Climate and Community Project. So before we get started, I have just a couple quick housekeeping notes to go over. I'm very excited to be joined by all of you here in person today um, so that we can have this opportunity to talk with David while he's in town. We are also live streaming today's talk. So to everyone joining us on Zoom, welcome. For our Zoom guests, if you need to turn on closed captioning to add subtitles to your screen, click on the show captains, captions button in the, your Zoom toolbar to do that. We will also have a staff member keeping an eye on the chat and Q&A box. So if you need any assistance, please let them know. We are recording this live stream and can share the link with everyone here today. For today's agenda, I'm gonna turn things over to David in just a minute for a presentation to set the stage for the discussion. Then I will have a few questions for him to dig a little bit deeper before we dive into questions from our audience. When we get to the audience Q&A, if you are in the room, please just raise your hand um, and I'll call on you. If you are joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A box to send in your question and our staff member who is moderating this will in the room with me, will read it out loud for you. And just a friendly reminder to keep questions short and concise so we can get to as many people as possible. Now I'd like to introduce David McDonald. David is a professor of global development studies at Queen's University in Canada. The focus of this project is alternatives to privatization. With its research partners in Africa, Asia, and Latin America and Europe, the project works with academics, social movements, labor unions, and community groups to deepen grassroots engagement and create research that is relevant and useful to communities and organizations most affected by these debates. David is the author of many books, including the new book, The Meanings of Public and the Future of Public Services, that we're going to talk about today. So thank you for joining us, David. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thanks to those here and those online. Um, this uh, is a presentation really about this book, but I just want to give a little bit of background uh, about uh, where this book came about. And um, this will probably resonate with many of you who do work on anti-privatization anti work. Um, and I started my career basically doing this, uh, started in Southern Africa and the work went global. But um, uh, as, as many of you know, we have to continue fighting privatization, uh, but it got to a point where I felt like I needed to sort of get beyond that. And as I'm going to talk about today, the, the focus of my work has been, well, what are the alternatives to privatization and, uh, and, and what do we mean by, by public? And, and part of that was because this discussion about anti-privatization work just got a little bit boring. And, and it's the same thing, the same, I mean, you know, it doesn't stop people from doing it, doesn't stop it from happening. Uh, but whether you're talking about water privatization in Uganda or healthcare privatization in, uh, in, in Canada, it's the same basic kinds of arguments. And it got to the point as an academic where it just sort of felt like shooting fish in a barrel, uh, a little bit too easy and a little bit too consistent. Um, and it just got a little bit depressing, always talking about the negatives that, uh, that are out there. And again, this isn't to suggest we don't stop, that we stop fighting privatization. Uh, we have to continue uh, with that work. But really what we've been doing with our project for the last 10 or 12 years is asking, well, we know what we're against, what are we for? And there's lots of bad public services out there. And just because something is public doesn't mean it's, it's something that we want to try and, and defend. So really, this uh, the municipal services project that I've been running is intended to be a critical assessment of public services. We try and find good examples, quote in quotation marks, and uh, assess well what makes them good, uh, what is it that's reproducible about them, what might be problematic about them. And so these are some of the publications that we've done, some of the book publications. We also have lots of other things, that all of which is available on the municipal services uh, project.org website most of which is free, much of which is translated in Spanish and French, uh, Turkish, uh, other languages. Um, so I encourage you to have, uh, to have a look at this. 
Um, the book I'm going to talk about today is in, in some ways a, a kind of a summation of the work that I've been doing, a more theoretical take on what do we mean by public, and hence the term, the, the title, Meanings of Public, and, and what does this mean for the, the future of public services. Um, it is a largely academic book, but I have written it to be accessible, um, and the book is actually open access, so if you go to our website or to the Rutledge website, you can actually download it uh, for free. I've left some copies here with Mary at Food and Water Watch, um, if, uh, if that uh, is accessible to you, um, and uh, I would you know, strongly encourage you to have a, have a look at it. So it, it really is also intended to be practical. What I'm going to do today is really do a quick run through the entire book. <laughs> uh, uh, there's seven chapters, and I'm just going to give you a really quick summary of, of, of what the purpose of it is, because I think it's important to understand, as I phrased it in, in this book, the limits and the possibilities of publicness. So I'll start with the, with the limits. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that what we have in this world today around public services is very impressive. And there's a lot of really fantastic public services out there. It's really unprecedented in, in world history. Uh, but it, it's important to also contextualize that within the context of well, how, how is public emerged, who in whose interest do, do public uh, public sphere and public services operate. So the, the first or second chapter really of the book looks historically at the meanings of publicness. And it's important to remember that before capitalist times, there really was no public sphere. Slave-based, feudal-based economies really operated in, in a private sphere. There was no sense of universality. There was no sense that the public uh, at large had equal rights and equal opportunities. It was a highly divisive kind of society um, that uh, was really truncated in terms of who, uh, who had access to the public sphere, and there really wasn't a, a public sphere in, in that sense. And with the emergence of capitalism, we really saw this change uh, quite dramatically. And there's this kind of irony with the emergence of private capital when they started to say, hey, we actually need a public sphere in order to A, justify our demands for rights as, as capitalists, and to have a kind of public sphere for trading. And as we'll see with regards to public services, they needed consumers and workers, et cetera, to try and, and you know, grease the wheels of, of private capital accumulation. Um, and so prior to the emergence of capital, nobody really talked about a public sphere. It was really, you know, what did you do in, in private? Uh, and uh, there was, again, no sense that everybody had sort of universal rights and accessibility. And, and capitalism transformed that. Until, of course, it became problematic and people started to demand uh, rights uh, that private capital started to say, hey, you know, this is going to be too costly. Um, we're going to lose control of, of, of this public sphere. And this reference here to the tyranny of the majority, this is a famous phrase from Tocqueville, a French philosopher's summary of what was going on in the United States, was this public sphere has gotten out of control. Um, you know, everybody thinks they have a say, and we need to try and basically shut this thing down. And that's really what we saw was a kind of an enclosure within 100 years of the emergence of a public sphere of, of powerful private interests starting to say, hey, this you know, notion of universal public rights, et cetera, is, is problematic. We need to have a more representative form of democracy, professional bureaucrats that we can control. And this was, of course, predominantly white male property owners that started to uh, control this public sphere. So we quite quickly saw this kind of refutalization of the public sphere. And it was public in name, but private in practice. So how does this relate to public services? And, and I argue in the third chapter of this book that this is it sort of goes hand in glove with the emergence of a, the notion of a public sphere. And we start to see really for the first time in history, the emergence of uh, a broad range of public services. And again, this was really designed to uh, serve the needs of private capital. They needed to have consumers to buy their products. Uh, they needed to have healthy workers. They needed to have the infrastructure to get people from A to B to you know, get roads, to get equipment moving, et cetera. So the history of, of public services is largely one of providing the facilities for private capital accumulation. So again, this kind of tension in there is in whose interest does the public operate? And the argument that I'm making in chapter three is that it, it not only operates in the interests of, of private capital, but it's then limited by what capital wants to get out of, of public services in terms of who gets access, who uh, makes decisions about it, who, who provides the service. 
Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there's a discussion in the book about the sort of neoclassical theory of public goods. And uh, this is at a theoretical level, really sort of uh, captures these, these constraints. And neoclassical economics basically determines what is public versus private based on its market characteristics. And private goods are things that you know, capital can say, hey, I can control who buys these things and, and whether they're going to pay for them or not. And public things down in that bottom right square, things like street lighting, it's difficult for private capital to actually charge somebody for the use of a street light. Mm -hmm. uh, and so but I was saying the other day that we're moving in that direction where, you know, wearing a biometric uh, uh, something form of something that can say, here's how much street light I use, and that beeps it back to the private company that owns it. And, you know, we can see we're heading in, in that direction. But using neoclassical theory as an example, tap water is a classical private good. It is a purely private good, according to neoclassical theory. And this is one of the rationales that market-oriented uh, economists will say why we should privatize uh, tap water. <clears throat> now, the other categories, where they're public and imperfect private and public goods, uh, are, are deemed by neoclassical economists as uh, market failures. And this, this isn't to say market fails per se, uh, but that it requires some kind of collective action. And essentially that means that the state is intervenes to say, hey, we, we need to make sure things like street lighting happen. If the private sector isn't, isn't able to do that, is unwilling to try and provide uh, lighting to, and because they can't charge people for it, maybe the state needs to intervene. Um, during the Keynesian era, a lot of these things were provided by the state, and then during the neoliberal era, we've seen this ramping up of the private sector providing these kinds of services. And again, all of this is really driven by uh, mainstream neoclassical economic theory, which defines public and private goods based entirely on their market characteristics. So ultimately, what I'm arguing in the first half of this book about the limits is that the whole notion of a public sphere and what public services are in market economies is shaped by the interests of private capital in terms of the theory and the methods and the kind of language that we use. And so we've found ourselves trapped really for the last hundred years in this debate about, well, should the state provide these services or should the private sector provide these services? But often the state is operating in the interest of private capital anyways. So is the state really operating in the interests of the broader public, or is it operating in the interests of private capital? And we, we're sort of trapped sometimes on this pendulum swing back and forth. And yes, you know, the Keynesian era was better in terms of access to public services for a broader range of people, but it was it really operating in the interest of the public at large, or do we need to sort of get beyond the kind of market-oriented state model that most of the Keynesian era um, sort of trapped us in? So that the argument in, this, in the first part of the book is that this, this sort of liberal public sphere has sort of uh, limited our landscapes of imagination, theoretically, rhetorically, and, uh, and methodologically. So the second half of the book is really about the, uh, how can we go beyond this? What are the kind of possibilities for change of thinking of a, of a more profound, more robust, more expansive notion of public? And how can that help us create uh, you know, similarly more robust forms of, of public services. And there's, there's four chapters that I, I discuss here. The first one is, is laying out new criteria for defining what we mean by a public service. And this is getting beyond the market-based criteria that neoclassical economists look at around rivalrousness and excludability and, and whether you know, it makes sense for, the, for private capital to be involved to say, how essential is a service? And, and what are the benefits of collective provision? And I lay out in the book some discussion about how we would assess these things, sort of biological necessity, cultural necessity, you know, how, how important is something? So water, healthcare, education, internet access, we could argue are essential services. Haircuts, I don't know. Sports fields, hard to say. So not everything is essential, uh, but it's important to sort of have that discussion about how essential is something, and that helps us discuss whether it should or shouldn't be public. Second part of that equ equation is, what are the benefits of collective provision? Clearly with water, having it provided collectively means you're going to get economies of scale, you're going to get better equity, better uh, control over quality of water, et cetera. 
So you can think about all of these kinds of things and think, well, how do they weigh out on that front? So let me use the example of haircuts again. Is there benefits from collective provision? Do we want state-run hairdressing salons? Do we want state-run restaurants, right? So it's it, these are different kinds of criteria to determine. And I think things like healthcare, education, transportation, housing, water, sewage, you know, the list is, very, is pretty long. Things that are both essential and would benefit massively from collective provision. And I would argue that's a really good way to think about what should constitute a public service. But of course, these, these things are universal, but they're, they're also flexible. And you know, there may be places in the world where haircuts are deemed really essential and people are happy to have the state run their hair salons. And that might be a case to be made for haircuts being a public service. Um, water, healthcare, electricity, I think, you know, some of these core services are very clearly universal, um, but there are you know, cultural and political and geographical differences which might constitute difference. And so I actually use the word publics. There's no single public. The world constitutes different types of publics, and therefore our notion of what constitutes a public service also needs to be plural in our understanding of, of how we want to look at I should also note that it, this doesn't say that there shouldn't be private service provision. Maybe things like haircuts and restaurants and music venues and so on should be run privately. So it, my book is not to argue that everything should be run by the state, but rather we need to think in a different way about where that uh, dialectic lies and that division lies between what should the private sector do and what should the public sector do. And rather than having those things to be determined by market characteristics, we should have them determined by things like how essential they are and what the, the benefits of collective provision. <clears throat> the chapter after that talks about the state and kind of ironic because I spend the first half of the book talking about how problematic the state is in market economies, how captured the state is by private capital. But the reality is we are not gonna solve uh, access to water, sanitation, healthcare, and electricity without the state in terms of resources, financial, human resources, et cetera. So the, the, the uh, title of this chapter is Within, Against, and Beyond the State. So working, as the title suggests, within the state when you need to, working against the state, and sometimes working beyond the state to make these things happen. So the state must be involved. It obviously has to be democratized. It has, has to be made more representative of the kinds of people that it serves. Multiple actors are needed, labor, community, uh, indigenous groups, et cetera. Uh, who are currently not often represented in, in state uh, facilities. And then notions of co-production, that the state doesn't always have to be the provider, that they can work with local groups, they can work with indigenous groups, and there can be multiple ways of balancing what that provision looks like. So again, this is not some sort of communist era, uh, the state knows all and does all, uh, but a much more dynamic sense of, of what a public uh, service can look like in, in terms of its role. Uh, the role of the state. <clears throat> the second last chapter looks at uh, measuring success. And part of the problem with public services is that they have been essentially over the last 40 years in the neoliberal era, uh, models from the private sector have been incorporated in to assess whether or not a water operator or a healthcare operator or a university is doing a good job. And those tend to be highly uh, financialized kinds of criteria. What does the financial bottom look like? How efficient is it? How many workers per connection, et cetera? So if we want to assess what we think is a good public service based on these existing uh, neoclassical kinds of criteria, then you know, what, are, what is it that we're assessing? So this chapter argues that if we're gonna have a different sense of what, means, what public means, we also need to have a different way of measuring success. And so I lay out a bunch of criteria, about 11 different criteria, things that are familiar, like efficiency, of course, we don't want to waste resources. But then democracy, workplace quality of life, uh, sustainability, uh, solidarity with other public service operators, things that are just completely ignored, uh, if not uh, simply rejected by mainstream benchmarking uh, models. So if we're gonna have new forms of public services, we need to be able to assess them and evaluate them in ways that make sense for the kinds of public services that, uh, that we want to see. And again, you can have universal criteria, but they need to be flexible. What's considered a success in Washington, DC could be very different than what's considered a success in Jakarta or in Buenos Aires or in, or in Paris. Uh, 
And so there's no singular way of doing it, but certainly you know, baseline criteria, things like transparency and accountability and, uh, and sustainability of public services. So that chapter lays out that, uh, those arguments. And then finally, I'll close with this, uh, this slide. The final chapter talks about how are we going to create a global public movement. As many of you in this room and, and watching online know, uh, the anti-privatization movement, it's been hard, but actually it's been remarkably successful in terms of its messaging, in terms of its impacts. Um, and, uh, and, and in part, that's because it has been a very consistent type of message. Uh, and whether you're again, you're in Brazil or in Argentina or in France, you know, the problems of water privatization or healthcare privatization are pretty consistent. And so it's been a very effective kind of critiquing of these things. My argument is that what public service is going to look like is not going to be as consistent. It's going to be very different from place to place. People are going to embrace publicness in different ways. So getting a single unified kind of message to build a pro-public movement as opposed to an anti-privatization movement is a challenge. There are no singular kinds of definitions. There's very different viewpoints. And, and I've gotten, I've had a lot of colleagues actually quite annoyed at me for critiquing some public services that are out there and for me saying, hey, you know, maybe this isn't as good as, as we think it is. Um, and there's been a reluctance to be critical of existing public services, in part because you don't want to feed into the pro privatization agenda. But we need to be willing to be critical of poor public services that are out there racist, homophobic, misogynist, deeply problematic public services. You know, do we embrace those things? Of course not. So, you know, how do we build a consistent whole public messaging uh, across the world is, is definitely going to be a challenge, but it's not impossible. But it is also limited by the resources available. And I can speak from the academic point of view, there's, you know, a thousand people out there doing anti-privatization work. There's not a lot of people doing work on well, what are the alternatives and what what does that what is that going to look like? So I think both in the NGO world, labor world, and, and academic world, we need more, more work on that. The good news is I think there's a, a growing movement, Food and Water Watch uh, being a fantastic example of in, in, in trying to embrace what you know what is it that we want, not not only what is it that uh, that we are against. Um, growing political support around the world, politicians and, and bureaucrats, et cetera, and, uh, and a growing field of research. And uh, in, you know, in, in my area in academia, um, you know, we're, our project, uh, we're constantly trying to pull uh, new people into this, uh, this field. So that's uh, Municipal Services Project. The website's down there. And um, please pop in and have a look and, uh, at our material. Thank you. Hey, thank you, David. Now we're going to begin with a few questions from me, and then we'll go to our audience for a couple questions. So I really appreciate the focus on building a positive vision um, and for more just and accessible services. So I want to kick things off with a question. So like the Utility Justice Coalition, a couple folks in the room are with that coalition, have been discussing a positive vision for utility justice that guarantees universal access to water, electricity, and broadband. And we want to also recognize the complex histories and differences among the sectors. So how can we build this pro-public framework that allows us to build for utility justice? And what do you think are the biggest challenges to building this movement? Yeah, uh, well, I think I touched on them in that last slide. Um, maybe I'll just back up there. Uh, I think this, this question of different viewpoints is, is a big one. I, I, I have a very vivid memory of being in Cochabamba in Bolivia when I first started um, thinking about doing this work. And uh, there was about 40 people in the room, mostly related to water. And uh, we were talking about remunicipalization, bringing services back in-house after they'd been privatized. And uh, half the people in the room just got up and said, we're leaving. If you want to talk about the state, we're out of here. We don't trust the state. Uh, you know, We want control as community groups, uh, as indigenous groups over how our services are operated. Um, and so their notion of what constitutes a public service is, is very different. <laughs> um, you know, there's uh, also questions of well, what, you know, in the United States, a lot of services are being bought, bought back in house by very conservative bureaucrats who their only interest in doing it is to save money. Uh, they're not interested in necessarily social justice or sustainability or transparency, et cetera. It's just they realize that privatization has failed on its own terms. It's not saving any money. Uh, and so we're going to bring, that's fiscally correct thing to do. We're going to bring it in-house. 
that's a very different vision than say, you know, what, what's going on in Barcelona and activists in Latin America. So how do you sit these people down in the same room and talk about a pro-public future? Obviously it, it's possible. So finding common ground on certain things, you know, uh, around, you know, and, and I think you get a conservative bureaucrat in the United States sharing around things like, you know, efficiency, uh, perhaps things on transparency and accountability. So I think finding some common ground on things that are consistent uh, and, and powerful can resonate uh, amongst different groups. Um, and so, you know, Searching that common ground is something that we're trying to do in our project, and, I, and I'm trying to do a bit with this with this theoretical work too. So, what are those kind of core criteria? Um, but uh, you know, I think we, we can't expect too much, and we can't expect it to happen too quickly. So, I think you know, it's still early stages, and and there's real benefits to having tensions and and debates about these things. Because, you know, until now, part of the problem has been people just supporting public services because they're public and they're worried about them being privatized. And that, I think, is much more problematic than being willing to be critical of public services and saying, how can we make these things better? So it's not an easy thing, but, I, you know, I, over the last 10, 12 years, I've seen really quite dramatic shifts in and really exciting debates on these things. Thank you. One way we're thinking about like the common ground is around a human rights framework. Um, and so one in interesting development that came my way just yesterday is that it looks like the Human Rights Council at the United Nations is developing a resolution on how public services helps promote human rights and help us achieve the, um, the development goals. We know that the United Nations officially recognized the human right to water in 2010 um, because of the global water justice movement, including our board chair, Marlon Barlow. I think you know. <laughs> so how does the pro-public movement advance human rights? And is, what is the relationship between these movements, the human rights movement and the pro-public movement? And is human rights the framework that can be like a common ground for these movements? Potentially. Um, I mean, there's quite a bit of interesting writing on the tensions around human rights. And I think it gets back to my early point is there's a, a liberal concept of human rights. Right. And, and the counterbalance to that is the responsibility. You have rights and your responsibilities and the responsibilities tend to be you have the responsibility to pay. And so, yes, you'll get water, but only if you pay for it. And it sort of justifies the commercialization and marketization and potentially privatization of, of water. Um, and it's not to say that people shouldn't pay for water, but, you know, to what extent is that commodified and, and marketized uh, and to what extent is it fair, et cetera. So a lot of the uh, human rights literature, mainstream human rights literature simply ignores those deeper uh, questions of inequality. And, uh, you know, is, is, is the right, uh, sorry, the responsibility of individual responsibility to pay or is it a collective state responsibility to, to provide things? And so you know, I think there are certain things like water and sanitation where, Governments should not be trying to make money or even break even. You know, these things should be serviced or sorry, subsidized from general taxation and, and other sources of, of revenue. So, yes, human rights are, are it's a powerful uh, kind of narrative to have, um, but I think it, it has to be coupled with a much more radical discussion about you know who's going to pay for these things, how fair is it, who gets access to it, et cetera. Because it's it's just too easy to sort of whitewash it by saying yes people have the rights to these things because governments simply have not lived up to these commitments on almost every human right we can think of thank you that's a great point too i think there's also movement in at least the water world about moving toward guaranteed services instead of affordable services so um so as a follow-up to that we know that the u.n water conference is next week in new york it's the first of its kind since the 1970s so what is the role of the United Nations and these international venues? And are there a space of opportunity or challenge or both? Yeah. Um, so the UN is, is global government. It's our only global government. Um, and so when I talk about the state and transforming the state and working within, against, and beyond the state, the UN falls into that. And then there's a section of that chapter about scaling up. So how do we, you know, think about the, you know, the responsibilities of the state at a global level with public services. And so the UN is, you know, in its various organizations are the only real game in town. So you have to work 
width. Go up to that. Uh, oops. There we go. Uh, you know, within, against, and beyond the state. I I worked with the UN, various organizations, and the UN is a very complex. You know, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of organizations within the UN. Right? There's no single UN. Some of which are quite progressive, some of which are really problematic and deeply neoliberal. I would say as a whole, the UN has become very neoliberalized over the last 30 years. So it's hard to find really progressive UN organizations. So increasingly, you know, people find themselves working against, and anyone who's been to the World Water Forums know that there's the alternative World Water Forum, uh, because we can't trust what the UN is facilitating uh, within these, these kinds of organizations. Uh, Things and then you know simply working beyond the state, so you know going beyond the UN. Now that's that's more difficult at the global level. It's, you know, can you do it at the local level, right? People have said, hey, we're going to provide our own water, right? We don't trust the municipality; they're not going to do that. How do you deal with you know global public goods? Who, who has the resources to do these kinds of things? And you know, besides the UN, the only other bodies are big multinational corporations. So if we're not going to trust them. Then really, the UN is is the only game in town. So. It, I think it's really important to work with you on. Uh, it's it's just so depressing. How and I was I was actually in, sitting in on a preparatory meeting for that. Uh, the OECD is is putting together a paper on financing water, which is a little more progressive because they've incorporated public banks into that debate. But it's a it's a line about public banks, which is really how can we use public banks to leverage private capital. It's a, just another blended financing kind of story. So, um, and I, I would encourage, you know, if you haven't, uh, if you get a chance to look at our website, that's really our focus these days is on public banks. Um, and, uh, you know, finance drives so much of this stuff. So we're, we're looking at public banks as public utilities. Um, and they're, you know, important public utilities because they, so, you know, they, they finance all kinds of public services. But you know, are they themselves transparent and accountable and, and democratized, et cetera? And so we're trying to find good example, examples rather of public banks working to finance these things. So I, I think the we need to be very careful about the way that the UN is is talking now about public finance and uh, um, and, and make sure again that it's it's not just you know yet another way of using public resources to facilitate private capital accumulation and. So yeah, I, I I don't have much faith in the UN moving us forward dramatically. Uh, I have a lot more faith in the kinds of organizations that are fighting against it. Thank you. Now we're ready to take questions from the audience. If you're in the room, you just raise your hand. If you're online, please put it into the Q and A box, and our moderator here will help us read it. Are there any in the room? Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm on like all at the same time because I double book right now. Um, but thank you so much for this. And I um and I and many of us in the room work with Mary on the utility justice coalition. Um we in particular, Mary and Liz do water, um, and we do power, and we have another cohort who does broadband. Um one of the things that we've been working on is how do, how are we leveraging the climate emergency for a pro-public agenda? Um and so for us in the US, we've been kind of you know. There's many things like post disaster relief, et cetera, where there's opportunities for transformation, essentially bringing it away from private to public, anti fossil fuel to clean, private to public, and to stronger public water infrastructure. Um, and so, I was just wondering on a global level how climate is being leveraged um, to, to help with, with this. Um, and then the second question I had is we're actually trying to work a lot on our Green Bank issue here in the United States. We just passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, Twenty billion dollars is going to to green banks. They are private, essentially, all public financing. And so, we if there are other pointers internationally about how we can um, put the screws on accountability on the on those institutions and make them think about the public responsibility they have as private you know, nonprofits or institutions funneling public money. That that would also be so I'm going to repeat the question back for yeah. folks online. Uh, the first question was, this is from Jean from Center for Biological Diversity, a member of the Utility Justice Coalition, was about how the global movement is leveraging the climate emergency to advance the pro-public agenda, um, and what are the places of intervention globally on that? And the second one is around green banks, um, and what are the what's happening globally on that So, um, in order to um, add some accountability to it? <laughs> 
On the first question, I think the uh, sort of green energy movement is really fragmented on that question. So uh, I've taught a course for a number of years now on energy democracy, and, and there's a really problematic element of it, which is just distrust the state. And again, not for not without good reason, <laughs> but their response to how we're going to address this is let's get more nimble private companies in there. Let's do um, uh, social uh, investments. Uh, let's do um, co-ops. Uh, and and it's there's a almost an anti-labor, anti-state rhetoric associated with with some of these things. Um, and again, not you know, for good reason, because the states have often invested in massive, dirty fossil fuels, nuclear power, large dams, you know, the environment be damned kind of thing. So, and there's not a lot of examples of, of big states transforming themselves, right? Um, but, uh, but it's been captured, I think, by a kind of entrepreneurial group, and that it also covers the sort of co-op movements to some extent as well. And that, you know, maybe some people are uh, writhing, listening to this, but you know, there are elements of that. There's some really progressive co-op movements, but there are some more, more problematic ones that are mimicking the private sector in many ways. And, and a co-op is private, right? So, and, and the, can you really scale up co-op to, you know, national level? Uh, global level, right? Um, I mean, there's 700 million people in Africa that don't have adequate access to electricity. A co-op's going to manage that, right? Or small little startups going to manage that. No, it's back to my point. The state has to be involved. And so I, I think that uh, uh, the energy electricity movement in particular uh, has a lot of pro-privatization debate going on. So I think the pro-public people um, need to say, yeah, we know that states have been problematic and public electricity has been problematic, but we can work within, against, and beyond the state. And you know, we're not going to solve the global electricity, renewable electricity crisis through co-ops and and small entrepreneurial startups. So, um, yeah, that that would be my one comment on that. The the financing question. Um, yeah, there's so much greenwashing going on. It's crazy. Everybody's selling green bonds. Everybody's investing in green projects, and all of the you know firms that assess these things are themselves private, um, and you know they have a vested interest in you know giving a thumbs up to corporations for saying yes, you're doing a great job. So you know we're realizing how problematic the private market is for green and carbon offsetting and, and so on. So we're actually starting now to look at, at public banks. You know, is, is there a way for public banks to do a better job at that because they have a public mandate, because they're more publicly accountable, et cetera? So, and I think there are good examples. And for example, Scandinavian public banks, I think have really cutting edge uh, sort of uh, ways of measuring how green their investments are. Uh, and they're investing in, in things that are by definition green, sewage treatment plants, uh, renewable uh, electricity systems, et cetera. So, you know, it's it's not this sort of marginal things that a lot of private banks are saying, oh, this is green, but you know, is, is it really green? So, but again, there's a lot of problematic public banks out there. So, you know, what is what is a good public bank and how can we use their resources to invest in things? And, you know, the transition to uh, renewable energy in, in Germany has been largely financed by public banks. and. Public banks are massive in Germany. KfW is the second largest financial institution, if I have that correct, in, in Germany. So, um, you know, these are, are not small institutions. So I think the, you know, the financing question, we can't rely on the private sector to resolve this energy crisis. And we're going to need to figure out how do we mobilize public resources uh, to have meaningful green transition. Yeah. Can I ask a question from our virtual audience? Yes, a question from our virtual audience. Great. Um, we've got a couple of people asking about um, corporate greed. Um, so I'm going to combine some questions from Mark, Robin, and a few others. Um, but essentially, you know, how do we get to the root of this problem of corporate greed? We've seen companies continue to price gouge with no major penalties by the federal government. What can we do about that to stop the corporate impulse? to continue to privatize more and more public services. 
And is there a place where people can find, you know, data on what these companies are doing? Yeah, so that, that's sort of at the what's what's wrong with the world out there. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, uh, and you know, that's a big question. Um, I think in terms of how can we try and change that, um, what I argue in, the, in this book is that we need to try to just claw back more of the public sphere. That the, if we can you know, bring services like water and electricity and healthcare and housing and transportation, some of these essential things that the private sector has taken from the state over the last 50 years, and, and reclaim some of that sort of surplus uh, associated with that, that then there's more resources available in public sphere for doing public good things. And now that doesn't you know, change the way the private sector will operate. Um, and so, but I think we can, you know, over time sort of transform the, the power of, of private capital to shape these essential services like education and healthcare and water, et cetera. So, um, you know, Public services, are, I think, are not the the only thing, but they are such an incredibly important part of our social, uh, environmental, and e economic lives. That if we can enhance that sphere, democratize that sphere, and uh, and and capture the the you know, sort of resources associated with that sphere more, that that will sort of, in some some respect, limit what capital can do. And it, you know, making sure it doesn't doesn't call shots anymore on you know, where are we going to build roads, uh, who gets access to to electricity. So, um, but you know, do you eliminate the private sector? In the book, I, I'm arguing, no. I mean, we don't want an or a world order where everything is provided by the state. That's not a world I want to live in. So where does where does that boundary lie? What does the private sector do? Do they do haircuts? Do they do restaurants? Do they do live music? Do they do water? Do they do healthcare? So I think that discussion of the boundaries between public and private are, are really important. And the private sector has been calling the shots on where those boundaries lie, and they keep gobbling up a bigger and bigger portion of that sphere of activity. So if we can push that back and shrink what it is the private sector is doing, uh, then we're going to have more control over their ability to be greedy uh, and and you know continue to sort of create that kind of inequality. Are there any questions in the room? Oh yeah, let's like one I can do the mic this time. Yeah, um, since we're talking about against and beyond the state, what comes to mind for me is when the state uses public services um, as a bargaining piece. In Jackson, Mississippi right now during their water crisis, we're seeing the state leverage funding for the water system for control over their airport and control over their policing system. Um, so I wonder like what to do when, <laughs> not just public services, but basic human needs that are public services get co-opted by a racist state? An excellent question. Yeah, I, I'm actually uh, on a bit of a road trip uh, through here and I'm, I'm actually hoping to get to Jackson Mississippi for just to sort of see firsthand what's, uh, what, what's going on. Um, you know, it, multi scalar nature of the states is important to understand that, right? And and this is one of the other reasons why I say we need to talk about publics rather than public, because uh, you know, where what level of state is, is a service provided at? What do those intergovernmental relationships look like in terms of who makes decisions, how resources flow within countries across borders, etc. So it's it's really complex, and um, you know, and there's different types of racist states. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, how do you deal with these things in, in different places? And ultimately, it, you know, it boils down to the specifics of, of that place. And people on the ground know, you know, where can you work with the state? And clearly, the, you know, the mayor of Jack, uh, Jackson, Mississippi has decided, you know, the state's important. I want to be the mayor of this place. I want to make Jackson, Mississippi the most radical city in America. That's what he wants to do. So, you know, and activists in Barcelona have said the same thing. 
you know, you can only work against the state for so long. You try and get control of the state. Now, you know, how are they going to change what, you know, the governor is doing in that? I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know enough about Alabama. Uh, uh, sorry, Mississippi. Um, so, uh, you know, but but I think that you know, this question of what do you do? Where do you engage with the state? And, and and you know maybe it is working beyond the state. Maybe it's just so far gone that you 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 have to go beyond it. And in places like apartheid, you know, the answer was we need to overthrow the state. We need to get rid of the state. You know, it happened peacefully in the end. But uh, and in other cases, you know, maybe you can transform things from within or against or or some combination of these things. So, um, I think that's the what's why I sort of say that we need to think about tactically and theoretically where the best places to to intervene and, and ultimately it's people on the ground who are best informed to answer those questions. Do we have another question from online? We do. All right, so these um, are questions about more of the, you know, legislative and bureaucratic approaches. Um, so Andrea is asking for the bureaucrats here, of which she is one, um, this is an obvious solution and need. However, the challenge is as much an implementation as political will. It's one thing to push for these things as an organizer, but it's another thing to do them as a leader. So she's curious what tools and frameworks exist for uh, bureaucrats, for people like her to actualize and implement this change. Another great question. Um, my response to that is that it, it, it gets back to this trap, liberal public sphere trap that we're in. Because you can say, oh, we want this to be public. But then if the only sort of public option is state top-down pedantic uh, services that the way they were done in the 1950s and 60s, are we really going to address the kinds of misogynist, racist, homophobic kinds of public services that are out there? You know? um, and if we're going to then assess ourselves based on market-based criteria benchmarking, how do we know if we've actually changed the way we do things? So we, we have to sort of escape this kind of bourgeois public sphere, as I call it in the book, a uh, marketized pu public sphere that we live in and, and try and think very differently about how we define publicness, how we measure success with publicness. And it's really hard. I, you know, bureaucrats, uh, their job is to say, okay, we treated this many patient, patients this month. We consumed this many, you know, this much resources. We have this many employees. And, and they're, they're constantly benchmarking their performance against these established criteria. Uh, coming up with new criteria that are uh, accepted by other municipalities or other public service operators or their bosses or their constituents is really difficult. So getting out of this, uh, th this way of thinking about what constitutes public service is, is gonna require a lot of innovation and hard work. And you know, that's why I'm saying things like coming up with new benchmarking models, right? How do we assess success? How do you, you know, evaluate whether a single mom on welfare is getting proper access to health care? Current benchmarking models don't allow us to do that. So can we introduce new kind of benchmarking things, which then you can then say to the public, hey, look, look how well we're doing, right? Um, and uh, so, so that kind of thing is is going to take a long time. And these, you know, it took thirty years for our public services to become as neoliberalized as they are today. It's going to take a generation for to de-neoliberalize these things. They're so embedded and, and entrenched. And so, there's going to be you know battles within, against, and beyond the state at various municipalities and various countries around the world. Um, and I think that the tactic here is finding ways to share these experiences and, and the lessons learned and the successes and, and the failures of these things. And, and that slowly we will figure out ways to define publicness and the success of a public service that aren't trapped by the kinds of marketized characteristics that they are today. Any other questions in the room? Do we have more online? Yeah, let's take one more. Um, so this question is from um, Joanna, and she's asking, you know, for people who aren't maybe aren't necessarily involved in this work on a day-to-day -day basis, 
Um, what are some of the best techniques that you've seen or used for involving people casually in positive public services modeling, um, similar to you know, the movement to have people vote with their dollars and not buy products from companies? Um, is there something similar that you recommend for people to get involved in this type of work? Yeah, I, I've seen lots and lots of different ways of doing it. And we've worked now in over 50 countries around the world. And uh, you know, what works in one place might not work in another place. I'll, I often use the example of uh, Paris, which remunicipalized its water in 2010. Um, and there was no public discussion. The municipal government decided that they wanted to not renew the contract of Suez and Veolia and bring it back in house. And on January 1st, 2010, it was Bout de Paris and it was public. The average Parisian had no idea, never involved in the discussion. They've since started to do engagement and talk to people about it. And it's actually they're quite dynamic about it. And there's some really interesting public discourse and, and people are now involved in uh, you know, a, a water, I just forgot the name of the water council that, that overlooks uh, water observatory, I think is the, is the English name for it. Um, but you know, in other parts of the world that would not fly. People would say, what do you mean you're telling us how our water, we want to be part of that discussion. You know, think of my comment earlier about people in, in Cochabamba, Bolivia, right? They, they don't want the state to be making decisions for them. So engagement can look very different in different places. And I think, you know, it's, it's up to people on the ground who can say, hey, this is what I think will make for a more democratic, more transparent, more accountable public service by you know, having weekly meetings or uh, creating citizen committees, or you know, they, they can look very different in different ways, involving workers in, in, in decision-making, right? We often forget about frontline workers and their role in, in you know, deciding what the priorities should be and how a public service should be, should be evaluated, et cetera. So um, there's lots of different ways of thinking about how we can make our public service more public. Um, and uh, this book and our, our other material and lots of other people working on this, you know, there's, there's, there's a growing literature on this. So I would encourage people to sort of, you know, reach out and try and read some of this uh, this material. But ultimately, you know, just say to yourself, if you're in, you know, Missouri somewhere and it's healthcare you're interested in, ask yourself, what do I think would make this a more robust, more democratic, more accountable kind of public service? And what can I do as an individual and how can I pull others into that? And, and learn from that process and, and network around. And you know the anti-privatization networking is fantastic in the world. We need to build this more pro-public kind of networking and sharing experiences for how have, you know, how have you improved things you know, in, in your sector, in your country, in your city. And, uh, and that's essentially the, the, the nature of the kind of work we're trying to do. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. That was our last question. So thank you, David, for coming thank to DC you. to join us. And thank you for everyone in the room and online for joining us today. I hope you have a good afternoon. Take care.